Chapter 22 June 27, 2033 Seattle, Washington, USA First Floor, Illini Building Negative 61 degrees Fahrenheit 2155 hours The whole of our office had gathered down in the store. Somehow, the cold seemed less biting, though I was sure it was as cold as it had been for over a week now. People milled about in what had been our staging area. I had surrendered my shotgun once we were safely in the store, so had the rest of the watch. The staging area had expanded since I had last been down here. The subsequent trips had had good cause to rearrange everything. But now, instead of five or six people, it was suddenly hosting nearly a hundred. I had no idea how many troops were present until we all gathered in the store. An officer walked toward the front doors. He turned and faced the group, waiting as quiet descended. Thank you, folks. Here's the plan. We have a few dozen vehicles outside. We had no idea how many people you had in your office, and I applaud your resourcefulness. Unfortunately, this means while everybody will be going with us, it's going to be a tight fit. Some of you look like you knows what I mean. I'm guessing you're vets. His voice was reassuringly rich, but not unapproachable. It was clear why he had been chosen to speak. The man had charisma in spades. I looked closer and saw Kirby. The name seemed familiar to me. The color pink tickled the back of my brain. A few small laughs filtered from the crowd, bringing me back to the present. I knew what Kirby meant, but only on an intellectual level. It's extremely cold outside, so we're going to let people out one small group at a time as the vehicles roll up. You will hand your packs to the soldiers on top of the vehicles and they will secure it. Then you'll follow instructions to get inside your vehicle. Get comfy because it's an hour-long ride to the base. You're going to be getting to know your neighbors very well. He chuckled at his own joke. I didn't laugh because I suddenly realized how cramped this was going to be. The kids were probably going to have it worst. I felt bad for them, then I remembered I had a separate mission, and I stopped feeling quite so bad. They were going to be safe. Gather up here in single file, folks. We'll be guiding you out and making sure you make it into your vehicle safely. He looked around, finding Castillo. He gave Castillo a curt nod. Castillo nodded back, then made a signal in the air to bring us in. I looked around and found Linda. I jogged over as she was getting in line. Hey! I've got to go help with the bunker. Stick with Jessie. She's going to watch out for you two. I'll be catching up in a little bit, okay? I could see fright in her eyes, but Linda nodded. A few feet away, I saw Jessie and Larry having a similar conversation. I reached out and pulled Linda into a fierce hug. She returned it with all of her strength. Come back in one piece, Dante, she whispered into my ear. Just then, someone jostled us. I looked down to find Eddie clinging to us from the side. I laughed and put an arm around him, too. I met Linda's eyes for a moment. I will, babe. Do wiser! Mason, let's go! yelled Castillo. He was only twenty or so feet away, so it was totally unnecessary to shout. I kissed Linda on her forehead and let them go. Larry walked up next to me. We stood in front of Castillo as he checked over his team. One of the other soldiers handed us each a Kevlar vest. I looked at the one they found for Larry and laughed involuntarily. It could have covered a smart car. He glared down at me. Once we had them strapped on, I realized how snug mine was. Somehow, despite how massive the vest had looked in his hand, Larry's vest now looked too small. How the fuck do you do that, Mason? I overemphasized his last name. I had somehow completely forgotten his name until Castillo yelled it. How had Castillo learned it in the first place? Larry looked down at me and chuckled. <laughs> I ate my Wheaties. <laughs> Fuck you, dude. I'm a normal-sized adult. Goddamn Jotnar. Ladies, shut the fuck up, said Castillo. Larry and I both chuckled. I don't think either of us had missed being in the military. Castillo ignored us and went over the plan one last time. We're going down the freight elevators in the back of the warehouse, cracking them open and rappelling down the shaft. It's approximately 200 feet, so don't fuck up. You still good on this? He asked, the last part addressed to Larry and me. Yeah, Sierra Foxtrot before I retired, said Larry. Special Forces, is there anything you didn't do in the military? 
Dude, do I know you at all? I asked, flabbergasted. He smirked. Dwizer, focus, I swear to God, muttered Castillo. Yes, sir. I've done rock climbing and military rappelling before. Great. Thompson, go get the rope. Velasquez, get these two idiots guns before I rethink it. They both barked a yes, sir, and took off outside as another group was loaded into a vehicle. About two minutes later, they came back with a massive coil of rope over each of their shoulders. I vaguely recognized it as carbon line. It had to be pretty light because neither one of them seemed troubled by the bulky rope. I guessed Velasquez was the one with the darker skin, but again, it was hard to tell through their masks. He handed me a rifle, one I was familiar with. M16A5, top of the line with all the bells and whistles. I felt a small thrill holding it. Larry took his rifle from Thompson. It looked like a toy in his massive hands. He shrugged and slung it over his shoulder. I did the same. We gathered up and Castillo signaled to move out. He led on toward the back of the store. We hadn't seen any of the Xenos for a while, but it was better to be safe than sorry. The soldiers led with weapons at the ready, flashlights on. I echoed them, rifle pointing at the ground, but ready to go. Larry walked quietly next to me. It was amazing how quiet he was for his size. I was careful and my shoes didn't make any noise, but he looked casual and was nearly as silent as myself. When we got to the swinging doors, Castillo set the squad on a breach formation. Larry and I stayed at the back as Thompson and Velasquez took each corner. Castillo and the fourth member, whose name I hadn't caught yet, centered up in a ready stance. With a flick of his hand, all four were through the door in less than a second, lights clearing the room. Nothing happened after a few seconds, so Larry and I carefully walked through the doors. The squad was still sweeping, but it was clearly due to habit and not necessity. The brushed steel of the elevator doors gleamed in the cast-off light from the flashlights. We made our way to the doors. The four of them took up a perimeter around the doors, facing outward. Castillo withdrew a slim object from a concealed pocket on his right leg. He flicked his wrist and a protrusion emerged. Then he handed it over to me. I took it and looked it over. It was a collapsible carbon fiber crowbar. Nice, I said. Castillo held a finger up to his mask and the universal sign to shut the fuck up. He then signaled me to go to the doors. I nodded and walked over. Larry stayed by my side. I slid the narrow tip into the crack between the doors and jammed it in to get some leverage. Larry stood opposite me and nodded when I looked at him. I leaned back, hearing the doors creak as I broke them free from ice. A moment later, the doors lurched and the crowbar slipped. Larry pulled his hands back in time to keep his fingers from being smashed by the doors clinging shut. I looked over to see Castillo once again shushing me. I wanted to give him the finger, but he was right. We needed to be quiet in case something tried to sneak up. I stuck the crowbar in again and once more leaned into pulling the doors open. This time the crowbar didn't slip and Larry was able to get his fingers in. I settled the crowbar on the ground, trying to minimize sound, then dug my hands into the doors as well. Together we heaved. The doors shuddered and groaned, refusing to give way. Then. Something cracked, and the door slid slowly open. Chin, spread a bar, ordered Castillo. I determined Chin was the fourth member. He shrugged something off of his back and fiddled with it for a moment. Then I was handed a bar just over a meter long. I looked it over and noticed a little pincer-like attachment on one end. Flipping it over, I saw the same at the other end. I shrugged and handed the far end to Larry. We began to set the device at waist height. The doors were easy enough to hold open, but it was still draining. Once we had the bar in place between the doors, it made a snick sound. Little tendrils came out of the pincers and it centered itself between the doors. I let go, as did Larry. The bar didn't budge. Impressive. You guys have some cool toys. Only the best for Uncle Sam's favorites, replied Thompson drawly. So, there's one white guy, two Mexicans, and a Chinese guy on your team. Wow, ignorance much? I'm Irish, first generation American. Castillo is Dominican, definitely not Mexican, and even though I'm sure Velasquez would love to cut you like a Mexican for your idiotic statement, he's Brazilian. Lucky for you, he's not an off-duty cop. Chen? Fuck, I don't know. I think he's Vietnamese, but he doesn't say much. 
Yeah, my bad. Chen sounds like my friend the giant here. Larry gently punched my shoulder. It still felt like being slapped by a ham hock. Ow! Oh, fine. Sorry, guys, what's the next step? Done fucking around? Work's about to start for real, said Castillo. It was hard to say for sure, thanks to the mask, but there might have been some humor in his voice. I nodded and stood out of the way. Larry followed my example. Velasquez and Thompson shrugged their ropes to the floor. Castillo explained while they set up. The shaft is about 60 meters long, 200 feet. We prefer a little extra for safety. So these are 100 meter lines. The guys are going to anchor them. As he spoke, I watched Thompson and Velasquez each raise a hand up high, noting that Thompson raised his left. A small black object was held in each hand. They struck straight down, causing a weird cracking sound. A whir sounded, followed by a small chirp from the devices. The anchors dig into the concrete and set secondary anchors. The line and anchors are each rated to 3,000 pounds. We'll be going three to a line and shouldn't even hit a thousand on each line. Thompson and Velasquez stood and I noticed both were about the same height as me. Without boots and helmets, maybe 5'9". They were lean but hard, as were the other two. Sierra Foxtrot indeed. They walked to the elevator shaft and threw the ropes down. I could hear it spooling out and thumping against the walls for an unusually long time. A second later, Velasquez took a plastic sheathed item out of a pocket and cracked it. He shook it for a moment, then ripped the plastic off. Two sticks were glowing in his hand. He tossed them down the shaft. The glow disappeared from the walls less than a second later. After what seemed an eternity later, the sound of the glow sticks hitting something far below echoed up. Even after two weeks, I still hadn't grown used to the silence inside the city. Castillo handed me a little device attached to a belt. I strapped it on and waited for further orders. These are your belays. Let them do the work. Don't go too fast or it'll stop you cold. We have a hundred feet of parking garage to get past, then a hundred feet of rock. The elevator should be resting at the bottom. We crack the access hatch, then open the elevator doors. Should be easy going after that. Copy. Who's first? I asked. I'll go left, chin right. Then I want you and Mason, then Velasquez and Thompson taken rear. We each clipped on, then Castillo and Chin went over the edge and into the dark shaft beyond.